begins in Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Mark 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who, were, who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Let us pray. Righteous Father, we thank you for this word that you have preserved for us about your Son, about what he did among us on this earth. We pray, Father, that you help us to discern its lesson this morning and to apply it to our hearts. Help us, Father, to be sincere in our coming to you and our coming to your Son. Help us, Father, to, uh, to not come trying to manipulate you as we saw Israel doing during the time of the judges. We know, Father, that we cannot hide our hearts from you. We cannot hide our intentions from you. And so, Father, we pray for sincere, genuine repentance in our hearts as we approach you. We pray, Father, that we may sincerely become disciples of your Son. And we pray, Father, that we will be ready on the day of his return. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, today's text presents us with a difficult lesson. Uh, because at first reading, the, the point of today's text may not be all that apparent. Um, the story that we have just read, I mean, it certainly points to the power and the authority of Jesus' ministry. That's on display through all of the gospel. So is there anything else that we are to discern from this story? There is. But as I said, it's a difficult lesson, one that might be difficult for us to palate, although uh, I don't want to say coincidentally, perhaps providentially. Um, it's something that we have been talking about in a, at least a roundabout way um, all morning in our Bible class and uh, as we've been taking the Lord's Supper together. But it begins with noticing what Mark has set side by side for us in this story. Jesus interacts with two groups in this morning's text. You have the great multitude that has come from all over the place, and they've gathered together to seek healing from Jesus. You've got that great multitude, and you have a number of unclean spirits. Jesus interacts with both of them in very similar ways, although our English translations somewhat obscure the way that Mark is putting these two groups in parallel with each other in a couple of important ways. Uh, first off, the way in which they approach Jesus. Our ESV reads, He had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around Him to touch Him. This loses some of the flavor of the Greek. And by the way, you, you know I've been preaching here long enough. You know I'm not the kind of guy who's constantly like, oh, the hidden secrets are in the Greek. It's that every once in a while, every once in a while, you'll read through a text in English and think, huh, wonder where that's going. And then you read it in the original language, and it's like, oh, wait a minute, okay, there's this stuff here that's just obvious. It's like plain on the page. Uh, one of the things in Mark's account that I think is lost in our English translation is that this crowd is falling all over Jesus. He uses one of the Greek words for falling. They're falling all over him to touch him. The demons also were falling. And Mark uses that same Greek word for fall, just with a different prefix on it, so that we are given this. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him. Both groups are falling 
around Jesus. The multitude's falling all over him. The demons are falling down before him. And Mark also parallels Jesus' response to the multitudes. All right, so the multitudes, the multitudes and the, the demons approach Jesus in the same way. Jesus responds to the multitudes and the demons in similar ways. He takes precautions against both of them. All right, our English translations preserve this sense in talking about the multitudes. He told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. The boat's a precaution against what the multitude might do to him. He similarly takes precautions against the unclean spirits. But our English translations have obscured this. In verse 12, he strongly rebukes the unclean spirits, lest they make him known. It's framed in exactly the same way as the boat in Greek, using exactly the same language. Mark tells us that Jesus has the boat set aside lest the crowds crush him, and he tells us that he strongly rebuked the unclean spirits lest they make him known. Again, our, our ESV just turns this into a simple imperative. He strictly ordered them not to make him known. But we're supposed to notice the parallels between the multitude and the unclean spirits. The point of all of this is to consider why Mark has set these things side by side. And to help us understand why, consider what the demons are doing. They fall before Jesus and they confess, You are the Son of God. Now, if I had told you that somebody fell down before Jesus and confessed him to be the Son of God in just about any other context, what would you think about that? If it was from anybody else, in any other context, I said, oh yeah, this person fell before Jesus and confessed him to be the Son of God. You think, oh, that's great. I mean, that's, that's practically the great confession right there. And yet, obviously... Obviously here, it is not an act of faith. The demons are clearly not confessing Jesus' sonship in good faith. They're demons. <laughs> now perhaps we can understand why Mark has set the demons side by side with a great multitude. Because the great multitude... They are also doing things that we would normally interpret as faithful. They're following Jesus. They hear about his healing and obviously they believe in his healing because they seek him out for his healing. And all they want to do is just touch him so that they can be healed. All right, in other places in the Gospels, these are all marks of faith following Jesus, hearing Him and believing in Him, just wanting to touch Him to be healed. In other stories, in other places in the Gospels, these are marks of faith. And yet here, Jesus is wary of these people, just as He is wary of the demons. And Mark has bothered to draw these parallels between the great multitude and the demons. What it suggests to us is that the coming of this great multitude is not done in faith. On the outside, it might look like faith. But we should be reminded... Of thing, I mean, we could be reminded first off of what we talked about this morning in the, uh, in the Bible class. Israel comes before God and they confess, we have sinned. We've gone after the Baals. We have forsaken our God. All right? And they put away their idols and they serve the Lord. And on the outside, it looks like repentance. And yet we find God's response to them is, I'm done with y'all. 
I'm not going to save you anymore. Go ask your other gods to save you. See if they'll do it for you. Right At the end of that reading, he's vexed with them. Because God sees something other than what we're seeing. We see what to us looks like repentance. But to God, looks like a manipulation. We should remember what our Lord says elsewhere. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We should remember also what James says concerning faith, that even the demons believe and tremble. We see both of those things on display here in this morning's text. Again, on the outside, what this great multitude is doing looks to us like, oh, that obviously that must be faith. And yet Jesus says, have the boat ready. As we saw last week, the kingdom of God is open to everyone. Jesus is dining with tax collectors and sinners. He's associating himself with them. The Pharisees are in the wrong for wanting to close the kingdom off to them. And yet, what we also find in the Gospels is that not everyone who claims to have come to Jesus has come to him in good faith, ready to repent and to obey the will of the Father. Not everyone has distinguished themselves from the demons, who, as we see in today's text, also bowed down before the Messiah and confessed him to be the Son of God. Hopefully we never have the opportunity to ask them how much good that did for them. The call today is to repent and turn to our Lord sincerely. There are all kinds of things that we can do, outward signs that we can accomplish, that might look to other people like repentance, that might look to other people like belief, and we might even fool ourselves well enough with these things. And yet we should always remember that the Lord knows our hearts. He could see when Israel was trying to manipulate him. He can see when we do the same. And so the call is to turn to the Lord. The things that the, the, things that the great multitude were doing, those are necessary things. The things that the demons were doing was a necessary thing. We must, each one of us, hear the good news of Jesus Christ and believe it. We must confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We must go further than that and repent of our sins. And if we want to be joined with our Lord, then we must join Him in His death by being baptized into His death and burial and resurrection for the remission of sins. If you have not obeyed that gospel call this morning, we invite you to do so. If you have been spending your time manipulating God, seemingly, if you are in need of repentance and restoration, if there's anything that you need to confess publicly, we stand ready to help you with that as well. Whatever your need may be, make it known by coming forward as together we stand and sing number 640, I have decided to follow Jesus.